Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Narula, I'll give a, a very short introduction in Portuguese. Then uh, I will ask, at the end of this introduction, I will ask Romeu to invite you to come to, to your lecture, okay? It will be 100% English. The discussion will be in English, just the introduction will be Portuguese, okay? I mean, after being with you and Romeo for such a long time, if I don't understand Portuguese, then shame on me. <laughs> great, great. Muito bom. É um prazer muito grande começar esse programa educacional promovido pela Conexa. A Conexa começou sua jornada como uma operação de telemedicina. Mas dentro do seu propósito de jornada, e o que interessava era a jornada, ela se transformou numa integração de soluções para entregar valor à saúde. Esse é o propósito da Conex. Ela não é uma plataforma, ela é uma integração de soluções. E quantas soluções houver ou vierem, elas serão integradas com um foco. O foco é transformar a saúde. O foco é atingir o paciente. E o foco é ajudar a gestão a ser mais eficiente. Por isso, o conceito de valor que trazemos no nosso DNA. A melhor maneira, o primeiro pilar da entrega de valor é a educação. E por isso, a Conexa tem esse programa educacional para compartilhar conhecimento. Dentro dos tópicos educacionais, não há tema mais relevante para a nossa sociedade global do que discussão de Covid. E a atualização da Covid em seus mais diferentes tópicos. Para isso, nós focamos aqui nessa reunião em Covid e coração. E quando nós falamos em educação e conteúdos de coração, fomos buscar dois usuários da Conexa, parceiros da Conexa, que são stakeholders para a promoção do nosso propósito. A Sociedade Brasileira de Cardiologia, aqui representada pelo professor amigo, nosso amigo, professor Evandro Tinoco Mesquita, o orgulho da cardiologia, que preside o Departamento de Ciência Cardíaca e coordena, coordena, senhores, a Universidade do Coração da Sociedade Brasileira de Cardiologia. Não poderia estar melhor representado, o professor Marcelo Queiroga, presidente da sociedade, estará conosco. Nesse momento, ele está tratando um paciente com infarto agudo. Ele está fazendo uma angioplastia nesse momento e vai se juntar a nós. Junto da SBC, para representar o, o capítulo de educação entre os nossos parceiros, nós trazemos aqui um dos maiores grupos educacionais do país, o Grupo Anima. E através de uma de suas verticais digitais, a Inspirale. A Inspirale é uma plataforma digital de educação à distância, mas também presencial, e por ser a distância presencial, híbrida. Como um dos maiores grupos educacionais, a Conexa se sente contemplada com esses dois pilares, educação, coração, cardiologia. E no fim, para falar de coração e covid como disse o professor Evandro, eu vou aproveitar as suas palavras. Nós trazemos aqui uma lenda. Nós trazemos uma lenda que foi considerado um dos maiores cinco inovadores da cardiologia americana. Sobre quem o Circulation escreveu um editorial. Um editorial sobre a vida desse inovador. Esse inovador já publicou mais de 800 papers de alto impacto. Vejam, senhores, 800 papers. Ao longo da vida que acompanha o professor Narula ele não fala senão daquilo que publica, senão daquilo que pesquisa. E por isso, ele é autor de 30 livros. Entre eles, o consagrado, a consagrada Bíblia da Cardiologia Mundial, o Hearst. O Dr. Diaga Tarula é editor da última edição do Hearst. Então, essa lenda é uma erudição da cardiologia mundial. Ele é o editor do Journal of American College of Cardiology Image e é professor de medicina, de cardiologia e de radiologia da Universidade do Hospital Mount Sinai de Nova York. Teve passado, passagem pelo, pelo Massachusetts General Hospital de Harvard e é um currículo, mas acima de, do currículo, e o currículo outras pessoas podem desenvolver. O Dr. Narula é a maior alma 
que conhecemos da cardiologia mundial. Por isso, eu trago o presidente do nosso conselho, o presidente do nosso conselho médico, nosso querido doutor Romeu Domingues. Eu peço ao doutor Romeu Domingues para introduzir o seu amigo de Agatarula para a nossa audiência. Por favor, Romeu. Obrigado. Boa noite a todos. Obrigado por, pelos amigos que estão nos assistindo. Botelho por ter convidado o Narula. Foi uma excelente sugestão. Nosso amigo, uma referência na cardiologia mundial. É, muito obrigado. Agradecer ao Evandro também, querido amigo, professor, que a gente tem muita admiração. E, para não falar mais, eu vou... É, desculpa, passar para inglês. É, professor Narula, Jagat, thank you very much. We are... Very proud to have you here with us. It's a great pleasure. You are a great friend. You love Brazil. You love our uh, our people, our colleagues, and I know that we're going to have a great presentation because you you are one of the best cardiologists that you have met and a, a special person. We a lot of people in Brazil love you, so thank you. It's a really a great pleasure to have you here with us talking about this topic that it will be very important: cardiology and COVID. So again, thank you very much, and uh, the point is yours. Thank you, thank you, uh, Romeo. So uh, uh, honor is entirely mine uh, to be able to be with friends uh, like uh, Dr. Dominguez, Dr. Botelho, and Dr. Tinoco. It is it is truly a privilege to be able to present, and uh, I will uh, try to do my best here. We'll keep it very slow and uh, will try and um, interact as much as I can. And uh, uh, Dr. Botelho, please stop me wherever you feel that I need to repeat things or am I not coming across clearly? Although I will try and do my best. So I'm trying to share my screen here. And um, Can you see the screen? Yes, we, we can see now. And uh, here Perfect. I can go on. How is that? Wonderful picture you selected. Brilliant. Okay, because it was evening. First, I was thinking of uh, uh, obviously bringing the daytime picture. But then I thought that since I'm giving the talk in the evening, I should have an evening picture. Uh, of uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, Rio. And uh, you know my fascination for Christ uh, the Redeemer and uh, uh, the day that we will visit the place together with uh, Romeo and you, uh, Roberto G. So, uh, COVID-19 and heart. It is almost one year now that uh, the COVID uh, was uh, first reported from Wuhan, China. And this report, which is the first report to appear from Wuhan, related to Wuhan pneumonia, that came out in February of uh, last year in JAMA. You remember that the people who had uh, COVID pneumonia, these are the folks who are older, and if they were older, it was more likely that they were admitted to the intensive care unit as compared to those who had the non-intensive care, suggesting thereby that old age was one of the most important risk factors for a severe disease. Also severe disease occurred in the people who had cardiovascular disease, as you can see here or if they had risk factors for cardiovascular disease, including hypertension, diabetes, cerebrovascular disease, and also obesity, which we found on later after this report was first presented. Not only that, if you look at the Center for Disease Control of China, they demonstrated clearly confirming the earlier JAMA report that as the disease increased, and you can see on the x-axis that the decades of the age as it is increasing, and by the time 
the patients are octogenarians, you will see that the death is significantly higher. It is about four times higher when the patient is 80 years old as compared to the current mortality. And current means the mortality as was seen in March of 2020. Also on the right-hand panel, you will see that this was the, the mortality rate in March last year in China. And when the people had the evidence of pre-existing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, hypertension, you will see that the likelihood of mortality was much higher as compared to the average mortality rate attributed to COVID-19. How exactly does the COVID-19 affect the body? Let us start with a little bit of a pathologic basis of how the COVID-19 or the so-called coronavirus enters in the body. And this is the coronavirus 2 or the novel coronavirus 2 as we called it, the NCOV-2. As we all know that the coronavirus basically on its surface does have uh, certain proteins. The spike protein, which is very common between the corona regular coronavirus and uh, as you had seen earlier in the MERS also, that uh, this disease or the Middle Eastern coronavirus, that the spike proteins were there. So it is something similar, but not the same. And as you can see here, that this is the, the spike protein or S protein as shown here in the green color. And then there are some other proteins and the other important proteins being the nucleocaspid protein or so-called N proteins. So these are some of the common proteins which you can see onto the cell surface of uh, the uh, coronavirus. Now, how does this coronavirus enter into our body cells? And as you can see here, that uh, these are the ACE2 receptors. And we all know that ACE2 receptor is one of the most ubiquitously uh, available. And uh, it is present on almost all the cells of the body, quite like the ACE1 cells or the angiotensin converting uh, enzyme 1 cells. So this is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is the counterbalancing receptor to the ACE1. And as you know, that ACE1 is a detrimental molecule. The ACE2 is a counterbalancing molecule, or it is an important molecule, which is a favorable molecule. And it does everything against the ACE1 receptor, suggesting thereby that this is vasodilatory, this is natriuretic, this is antioxidant, it is anti-inflammatory, it is anti-remodeling, suggesting thereby that all good properties against what you see in the ACE1 receptors or as you see in the angiotensin 1 receptors. So these spike proteins, they bind to the ACE2 receptor after these have been changed configurationally. And how does this configurational change occur? It is by the presence of some co-stimulatory molecules as you can see here, which I'm showing here in the orange color, yellow orange color here. These are some molecules quite like what they are called as Tempress 2 molecules, that when the Tempress 2 molecules engage in this combination, they make the change in the spike protein, quite like this here, that the some of the domains of this spike protein, they stand up and then they are able to bind to the ACE2 in a way that this moves into the cell by the process of endocytosis. So what is very important here is that you have to have a coronavirus which has to be alive. And when it is alive, it has the spike proteins on top of it. And that it has to have an ACE2 receptor as well as it needs to have the co-stimulatory molecules, as you can see here. And this combination allows this virus to literally crawl on the cell surface, get into the endocytotic vessel, vesicle, and uh, then it gets into the cell. It is the vesicular transportation within the form of 
endocytosis. So, certain organs which have significantly high expression of the ACE2 molecules, they will be able to take up the coronavirus quite like here you will see that it is in the tracheal epithelium. It is also in the nasal epithelium. It is also on the tongue. It is also on the gastrointestinal system. It is also on the uh, urinary system that as the coronavirus comes in and here you would see the uh, the uh, electron microscopy pictures you can clearly see the coronavirus sitting here in the insect you can see the corona of the virus or those which are made up of the spike proteins and here it binds to the ace2 receptors and then it is internalized and as you can see here that now it has started to come into the alveolar epithelium. So here you will see that these are pneumocytes in the alveolar epithelium and they bind to the pneumocytes and they get into the pneumocytes type 1 and type 2, predominantly type 2, the ones which are able to produce the high line on the, um, on the uh, alveolar epithelium. So here you can clearly see the uh, presence of the coronavirus or novel coronavirus in this uh, electron micro micrograph in this particular case. Now, once it has come here, it starts its damage. And as you can see here, that this is the earlier uh, um, uh, picture of the pneumonia that is settling in. So, when the pneumonia starts to occur, there is a uh, the uh, alveolar damage here. You can clearly see the diffuse alveolar damage in this particular case clearly see this acute highland membrane formation here, which obviously tells you that uh, the integrity of the epithelium of the uh, of the alveoli is uh, losing and that the through the interstitium, it is also affecting the uh, endothelium because around the alveoli are the alveolar vessels. And now this leak starts to occur from the, from the vessels here. Now, in the diffuse alveolar damage, now you are seeing the organizing phase here. So, the organization has started to occur and then you will find the reactive pneumocytes. Here, the healing has started to occur. You can clearly see various giant cells here. These large cells that you can see, these are the giant cells. And you will also see that there is the perivascular lymphocytic infiltrates. So, it is a full-blown inflammation at this time of the healing when it has started. And if we let this process continue, the lungs really turn into leather. Once this process starts to get into the late stages, it completely destroys the lung. It is absolutely a very abnormal sight when you really look at the delayed uh, uh, process in the lungs when we look at them during the autopsy in these cases. Here you will see that the there is a staining for the spike protein, suggesting thereby that the virus is here. And again, here you will see that these are the pneumocytes and with the uh, macrophages, some macrophages here, and also the spike protein in this particular region. Now, at this point in time, as I earlier said, that once the epithelium starts to get damaged, the virus would start getting into the uh, interstitium. From there, into the epi, the endothelium of the capillaries. So you have the alveolus here, you've got the interstitium, you've got the capillary around the alveoli, and you will see that all the cytokines and all the damage is occurring, the monocytes which are here, the, these are turning into the macrophages, they are going through the interstitium, into the endothelium, into the vasculature around it. So here are the pneumocytes type 2, you can see it here, the coronavirus is coming into this virus. And as you can see here, that uh, the TTF1 staining, that means the endothelium is lost, almost completely lost here. Uh, I'm sorry, the epithelium of the alveoli is completely lost. And there are the interstitial capillaries are also showing the loss of endothelium here, suggesting clearly that the damage has started to occur and the coronavirus is now getting into the bloodstream. Now here you will see that uh, it has reached the uh, the uh, enterocytes 
or into the intestines and there also you can clearly see the the um coronavirus here and similarly here in the proximal convoluted tubule epithelium of the kidneys also that it reaches wherever you have got the ace2 receptors and as i told you that in the enterocytes as well as in the kidneys the ace2 is very extensively uh, present or expressed quite like the lungs and the nasal epithelium etc now once you have the uh, it in the blood vessels you see how it starts to modulate the uh, the endothelium now endothelium we all know is an organ which is anti which has anti coagulant properties anti aggregatory properties that nothing can come and stick to the endothelium endothelium produces multiple multiple type of uh, 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 chemical substances and uh, chemokines and other things which basically do not let anything happen to the endothelium and endothelium remains glistening clean because it produces heparin it produces thrombomodulins it produces pro prostacyclin it also produces fibrinolytic molecules quite like the plasminogen activators whether it is the urinary plasminogen activator or uh, the tissue plasminogen activator it is anti inflammatory it is also it produces a barrier that nothing can cross the endothelium then it is a vasodilator because the nitric oxide is formed here it is antioxidant that it takes care of all the oxidative stress so the healthy endothelium is an extremely important organ it is the largest organ of the body and it basically protects us from having any damage to the organs that it is supplying the blood to but once the virus is in here once the macrophages which have collected the virus they come in here they start to produce the cytokines and they start to produce the damage now the damage that occurs in the endothelium occurs in four stages the endothelial damage type 1 or we call it a type 1 activation that in the presence of the cytokines the type 1 activation suggests that the stored granules of the proteins are released there is nothing new which is forming but whatever proteins were stored in the endothelium they are released and the two most important proteins are one willebrand factor which is as you very well know is a pro coagulant molecule and p selectin which is expressed so p selectin comes here and that is expressed onto the cell surface now these p selectin molecules when come on the cell surface the one willebrand factor comes and sticks to it p selectin will bring in platelets one willebrand factor will start the coagulation so there is a sinister cycle or there is a damaging cycle that starts and the thrombus starts to produce and as you know that the thrombosis in the vessel or so called intravascular thrombosis in is one of the most important unfavorable happening in the covid 19 that is something which is related to the adverse or unfavorable outcomes in the covid 19 now the stage 2 of the activation by the cytokines by the macrophages by virus getting into the endothelium because endothelium also has the ace2 receptors and some of the viruses get in there the entry of the viruses is not great in the endothelium otherwise all of us would have died with the covid-19 infection why because the co-stimulatory molecule as i told you the tempress it does not express as much on the endothelium and that is the reason that we are still able to fight with the disease now in the phase 2 activation or type 2 endothelial cell activation the e selectin is uh, uh, is produced i cam is produced v cam these are the adhesion molecules which bring in various cells like uh, the monocyte the neutrophils and all other molecules which come in there and when the neutrophils specifically come in there these neutrophils are able to produce something what we call as netosis or the neutrophil exit traps that these are created that they put their dna out 
the neutrophils put their DNA out and they trap the virus. They don't let the virus escape from there. And then there is also the thrombosis which starts to occur. In the phase three of the endothelial activation, there is something what we call as NOIKES. And NOIKES is when the endothelium loses its home. It's a Greek word. And uh, when it loses its home, that when the endothelium starts to slough off from the basement membrane or there is a denudation of the basement membrane and all these proteins, they start to violently produce as the endothelial cell undergoes apoptosis. And finally, the endothelium undergoes necrosis and all the proteins which are linked, most importantly, the thrombomodulin and von Willebrand factor, which are associated with the, the necrosis of the, uh, the endothelium. And this is something what you call as AMP or DAMP. The PAMP or DAMP, which is the pathogen associated molecular patterns or damage associated molecular patterns that there is a significant amount of pro-coagulant and pro-thrombotic activity starts. So a, an endothelium, which was a very uh, favorable organ. And uh, uh, the uh, as you can see, now it turns into the unfavorable organ because now it starts to cause coagulation. Now it starts to prevent fibrinolysis. It causes inflammation. It removes the barrier because it has been lost. The endothelium has been lost. It becomes a vasoconstrictor and it becomes pro-oxidant and these NAR, uh, neutrophil exit traps that are formed here. So here you would see that significant amount of thrombosis that starts to occur in the vasculature, small vasculature as well as large vasculature, minor and major, micro and uh, macro vasculature, both in the venous side as well as in the arterial side. So you can clearly see the pulmonary embolism here here, there is a deep venous thrombosis. Here, it is the prostatic vein thrombosis that is occurring. In this CT scan, which Ro Romeo will uh, like to see, that the splenic artery here is totally occluded by the thrombus. You can see that in this. And when the patient died, the uh, autopsy was performed. And you can see that the thrombosis of the splenic artery is occurring here. And you can see that it has got significant amount of inflammation in there. And here it is in the higher magnification. And here we can show that there is a complement deposition. And whenever there is a complement deposition in the vessel, it means that there is a significant amount of hypersensitivity reaction going on. When the complement deposits in the myocyte, it tells us that it is the ischemic damage. But when it deposits in the vessel, it tells us that this is a hypersensitivity phenomenon. Now here you will see that there is a lot of fibrinoid degeneration which is occurring in this case. Now, again, Romeo would like it because this is the new advances here which the radiologists are making. And uh, they are now using the GP1 molecule here, which is the uh, platelet uh, 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 binding uh, substance. It is a small little molecule which has been labeled here with fluorine. The data comes from... Um, the um, uh, from uh, uh, Korea, from Dr. Um, uh, Dai Moon's group, from uh, the um, uh, uh, from uh, Seoul National, and as you can see here, that uh, you can see all the areas with thrombosis. And uh, I'm now uh, collaborating with Dr. Dweck from uh, uh, from Edinburgh, where we are going to be doing them in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the treated or resolved COVID cases, so as to identify as to how many people continue to carry the thrombus even after the COVID has resolved. And now we have shown some of our pathologic studies that the thrombus after the COVID remains in the vasculature for a long period of time with the virus embedded in these thrombi. So we know that the venous thromboembolism is common in 30% of people. Strokes are common in young patients. Frequent post-mortem pulmonary emboli are seen. The arteries of the hands and legs, they have the involvement. Unlike the peripheral artery disease, the gangrene of the arms is very common in COVID. 
I mean, it's common, not very common, but it is common in COVID as much as the gangrene of the legs is. And the post-mortem multivascular vascular microthrombi are often seen, which were not suspected b- before the death of the patient. So these are the data from our center. We have got a large registry of the COVID patients. We now have more than 6,000 patients in our registry. And as you would see here, that um, the uh, we did the observational analysis was published in JAC, 2,700 subjects which were admitted to the Mount Sinai system. We found an association between in-hospital uh, the anticoagulation, uh, both therapeutic and uh, uh, prophylactic and uh, improved survival. However, the latest trials have shown that the therapeutic uh, uh, anticoagulation may not be uh, may not be as beneficial because there are significantly uh, high uh, likelihood of major bleeding episodes. And uh, but the prophylactic uh, anticoagulation is still continued uh, as compared to no prophylaxis um, uh, uh, or as compared to no uh, anticoagulation. Our uh, second report, uh, which got published recently, when the 4,500 uh, patients were seen, you can clearly see that the mortality was 50% lower in the people who were receiving anticoagulation as compared to those who were not receiving anticoagulation. Now, once the uh, monocytes come into the circulation and they are loaded with uh, these uh, uh, viral particles, you can clearly see that whether these are the epithelial cells or these are the monocytes with or without the, uh, the coronavirus in there, they basically start a significant, significant upregulation of cytokines, even cytokine storm. What is the cytokine storm when basically there is this abundance of the cytokines and they become perpetual, self-perpetuating, that you continue to increase the release of the cytokines from this to other organs as well as within this organ that it is causing its own release of cytokines. It is causing the release of cytokine from various other uh, elements of the body. And you will see a large amount of IL-6, TNF, IL-8, IL-10, and uh, IL-1, most importantly, the IL-1 here. And uh, multiple, multiple of these cells and the cytokines play a role in perpetuation of this. So this is the monocyte which is actually turning into a macrophage when they settle in the interstitium. All these macrophages can be brought as macrophages from the alveoli, which have entered from alveoli into the vasculature. And now the IL-1, as I said, is the most important molecule. It causes its own induction. More IL-1, more IL-1, more IL-1, more IL-1. And it leads to the endothelial cell activation and also to the release of the nuclear factor uh, kappa uh, beta uh, stimulation, which causes an intense cytokine storm um, uh, in association with the monocytic or macrophage cells. And then there is also an upregulation, as I told you, of uh, interleukin-6, which gets into the hepatocyte, works as the acute phase reactant, works on the liver, produces D-dimer. So now D-dimer, which is from the fibrinogen, which comes out of the liver. And as you can see, that more fibrinogen, more pi-1, which is the plasminogen activator inhibitor. So not only that you are getting more fibrinogen, which is the coagulation element, you are also producing the inhibitor of uh, the fibrinolysis, suggesting thereby that more and more coagulation will start to occur because of the cytokine storm. So not only that uh, we were having the uh, increase in the uh, the activity because of the endothelial activation. Now we are seeing that there is an increase in the activity because of the endothelial cell activation, but leading to the cytokine storm and cytokine storm also resulting in the pro-coagulant and pro-thrombotic uh, activity. Now you can clearly see that more and more cytokines are being released. So whenever there is a cytokine release, you will see that blue color here is for the survivors of COVID-19 and red color are, is those who died of the uh, COVID-19. And you will see that whenever the patient has died, he had higher level of D-dimer, higher levels of um, 
the uh, of the serum uh, ferritin higher levels of the interleukin 6 higher higher sensitivity of uh, the uh, cardiac troponins as you can see here and uh, lactic uh, dehydrogenase or ldh as you can see here so and uh, then you will see that more and more uh, the lymphocytes are becoming lower here and more and more of the fibrinogen that starts to get consumed in these cases now as these uh, macrophages reach the heart they bring the coronavirus with them they bring the coagulant activity with them and there is a damage to the myocytes now how the damage to the myocytes is occurring i will discuss in couple of minutes but in our report of 3000 subjects we demonstrated that uh, most of the people had mild release of the uh, of the troponin and about 33% uh, 33% of them but uh, only few of them had the intense release of troponin higher the troponin release more sinister was the outcome or more adverse was the outcome in these cases and as you will see in these three panels here the green are all the subjects who are uh, admitted to the hospital blue are the subjects which were discharged uh, from the hospital and red are the subjects which died uh, in the hospital so you can clearly see that when the troponin levels were low that is less than 0.03 nanogram per ml you will see that the uh, of all the patients admitted to the hospital most of them survived and were discharged only a few patients died but when the troponin levels were highest very few patients survived and most of the people died in the hospital suggesting thereby that the damage to the myocardium is one of the sinister uh, uh, findings so the expectation was that when they found that coronary arteries were not involved in many cases the question was that do they develop myocarditis and people started to say that if the coronary arteries are normal in these cases most of these people are developing myocarditis so the autopsy series which was presented by dr christina basso from uh, padua in italy in combination with the, the mayo clinic of uh, rochester in minnesota as well as mass general hospital from boston they demonstrated that out of the 21 cases of autopsy that they had presented most of the people demonstrated the presence of macrophages in the interstitium as you can see here and here there is a staining for macrophages but there was no damage to myocytes suggesting the presence of myocarditis lymphocytes were only present in uh, very few people as you can see here up to about 14 15% of people the lymphocytes were seen and here some of the myocyte damage mild myocyte damage was found however as you can see here that the fat of the epicardium or in the pericardium there was a significant uh, um, uh, inflammation in in those uh, cases and uh, then in the microvasculature they found significant amount of thrombosis or intravascular thrombosis in these cases as is being shown in this particular case but when you look at the myocyte if we have got so much of macrophages there which are bringing so many of uh, 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 of the uh, coronavirus and the coronavirus is freely floating uh, either with thrombus or without thrombus in the in the uh, vasculature it should get into the myocyte and it should cause the damage to the myocyte it should cause myocarditis so here you will see that in this very elegant report from dr eloisa arbustini and uh, tabazzi from uh, padua italy you can see that coronavirus is present in the heart but it is present either in the fibrocytes or in the interstitium or in the macrophages here you can see that it's in the macrophage it's a plumpy macrophage where it is present and you can see here very easily and it is coming out of the Uh, macrophage now it is being exuded or it's being thrown out of the macrophage but even this macrophage does not get into the cardiomyocytes it does not cause the cardiomyocyte damage and that is great if did not did not happen all of us will have heart failure after the covid 19 because it would have just totally damaged our heart cells cardiomyocytes quite like it damages our lung cells and it renders the lungs completely fibrotic it would have done the same thing to our hearts all of us would have needed heart transplantation quite like 
the people who have got the significant lung damage, they end up needing the lung transplantation, actually double lung transplantation. And why does that not happen? And here you would see this, that for the coronavirus to occur, uh, to enter into the cell, you require both the spike protein as well as the stimulatory, co-stimulatory molecules, quite like the Tempress 2. And these are the cells which are vulnerable cells, quite like lungs, quite like uh, kidney cells, quite like uh, uh, intestinal cells. But what happens in the heart? Heart has the ACE2, very high expression of ACE2, very high expression of ACE2, even more than lungs. But it does not have Tempress. And because there is no co-stimulatory molecule, you are not able to structurally reconfigure the spike protein. And the spike protein is not able to bind to the AS2 and it does not get into the cell. So it makes the heart cells almost invulnerable. It does not allow the cell to get into the cardiomyocyte. Now here you will see that heart as compared to lung, has too much of the ACE2 expression. This is the ACE2 receptor. Almost maximum, as almost close to what you see in the kidney. But even more than lung. But when you look at the RNA master blot here, you will see that in the lane 3, it is all heart, aorta, skeletal muscle. There is no co-stimulatory molecule. There is no tempress. You can see in the colon, again it is there. You can see the prostate, you can see stomach, it is there. Similarly, you can see it in the pancreas, salivary gland, breast, it is there. Here you would see that the kidney, liver, small intestine, you can see lot of tempress. Here you can see lung, trachea, lung, a lot of tempress. So you have to have the virus, you have to have ACE2, you have to have Tempress for the virus to get into the cell. Since heart does not have it, it doesn't get into the heart. So, why does God, the heart get affected at all? Why does it produce troponin? And now we feel that these are the cytokines. It is the interleukin 6 which is causing this heart to temporarily get affected. So, most important thing which we recently presented was that the right ventricle gets involved. This is the autopsy study from Fox and Basso. And you can see that the right ventricle is significantly dilated. Right ventricle has become almost as big as the left ventricle here. Here you will see it is bigger than the left ventricle. Similarly, here it is equal to the uh, left ventricle. So it becomes big. Right ventricle gets dilated. Right ventricle has significant damage. And how do I see the damage? How do I see the ischemic damage here? I see the damage by the complement uh, 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 presence in the in the myocytes here. Uh, as you can see, it has been stained. Now, why is it that the right ventricle gets uh, affected the most? The reason is that right ventricular wall is a thinner wall. And that's why it is way more damaged when the, uh, the uh, there is a cytokine excess or when there is a cytokine storm. And here you would see one of the person almost coming with the significant ST elevation with the ST myocardial infarction. However, patient had the normal coronary vessels. His right ventricle was normal, but within three days, you see his right ventricle has become significantly dilated here. And when the, uh, the, when the patient died and uh, there was a significant right ventricular dilatation suggesting that the right ventricle is affected heavily. However, I would like to end our talk uh, by two most important features which I want to bring in. And that is the delayed manifestation of COVID-19. What is the delayed manifestation of COVID-19? Now, as I told you that the thrombus may continue to be in the heart. The thrombus with the coronavirus as well as there is a significant cytokine damage which might continue to occur. There could be a reactivation. There could not be a reactivation. Still, it may be effective. And also, that uh, the edema that it has caused in the myocardium, quite like all viruses cause that. It may take a much longer time for the interstitium to clear the edema. And in this very elegant study, 
which was presented by dr ik nagal and uh, valina uh, Va- valentina pantman from uh, uh, frankfurt uh, in this study they demonstrated 100 people 78 days on an average after the covid had resolved they all have now negative swabs they demonstrated that the the magnet resonance image uh, imaging abnormalities remain in 80% of cases and now i have started doing the mr in all the patients who during their covid acute covid phase had uh, troponin leak i basically definitely do mr even after their swab has become negative after 3 months visit i do their cmr their lv volume is increased their mass is increased their native t1 time is increased in 70% the uh, t2 time is raised by 60% suggesting thereby that still there is an edema and t1 is suggesting that there is an increase in the extra cellular uh, cellular volume in these cases the late gadolinium enhancement was positive in 30% of cases and then the pericardial epicardial area late gadolinium enhancement was seen in 20% you had seen in pathology that it was present in about 14 15% uh, no it was present in uh, uh, close to 18% and here it shows in the uh, cmr that it is close to 20% confirming the autopsy data here so the t1 t2 increase was related to the troponin release in these cases and they performed the endomyocardial biopsies which only showed a little bit of an infiltration in the severe cases with the macrophages but essentially there was no myocarditis although all the features of myocarditis by cmr present but there was no myocarditis present in the pathology in these cases so the second important thing you might have heard about some people who have completely normalized and then they come back with a second uh, phase which is not active but they have got sudden heart failure that they present with so when we see these cases are quite like kawasaki type of a situation but when you look at the endomyocardial biopsies they are very different the endomyocardial biopsy of the acute phase the first phase when there was an active infection they demonstrated some infiltration in these cases while when they come as a delayed manifestation there is no active disease but there is possibility of a cytokine or uh, the damage occurring because of the intravascular thrombi you see endotheliitis in these cases or vasculitis in these cases and uh, you basically see a very different picture and these people respond very well to the steroids so you give them the dexamethasone or prednisone in these cases and also the infusion of the interleuc- interleukin um, uh, 6 um, antagonist uh, which is given uh, in these cases like uh, tocilizumab these people do very well and are we are able to discharge them from the hospital so to finalize in these cases when you see the delayed manifestation of the myocardium it occurs either because of the significant cytokine excess quite like what we see in the car t cell therapy that there is a hyperimmune response in the body which is because of interleukin 6 interleukin 2 and tnf alpha or it is because of uh, the uh, uh, something similar to what we see in the uh, the uh, the uh, checkpoint inhibitor uh, therapy that there is a macrophage activation and these macrophage activation produce lots of cytokines and they cause the damage and covid-19 does something similar either quite like the car t cell therapy or quite like the uh, immune uh, 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 checkpoint inhibitors in these cases and they result in a similar kind of uh, cardiotoxicity so uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen um, it is a intriguing disease it is uh, present in the body once it has uh, 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 ruptured through the the defense of the lung uh, but it is not able to infect the myocytes but is able to produce significant damage uh, but Uh, it is not able to produce myocarditis in such cases so what we need to do is we need to recognize it right the people who have uh, resolved or who have recovered we need to follow them properly 
if they had the high troponins we will like to get their cmrs done and we will like to follow these cases more closely these patients need a close follow up whether their lung functions whether it is their um, um, uh, uh, cardiac function or whether even it is their neuronal or the brain uh, 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 affliction we really need to take care of these patients this has taught us a lot we will continue to learn on a daily basis with this disease and we need to be careful so as to prevent the future abnormalities in such cases thank you very much dear jagat ji what a incredible 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 lecture before i open to professor tinoko start his comments i i would like to to highlight that when we are facing a, a new disease unknown disease we need to to fight taking all the weapons the first of them is definitely pathophysiology number one. i would say that number two, we would need the uh, registries because we don't have time for international randomized multi center clinical trials we need registries and we need international collaborative efforts to increase the case load to reduce the noise and to bring signals you clearly gave us a wonderful view of uh, a brilliant cardiologist because you showed a lot of uh, pathophysiology to direct our targets and you shared with us some beautiful slides one of them from zina yes i was excited about that mm. and number two, you brought as i learned from you your incredible multinational network and then you made us revive eloisa tavazzi from italy then you collect all the information from your international network to bring us some information and now we are getting some uh, targets we are getting some uh, Uh, therapeutic uh, results to to help people and uh, before i open to to the public i'd like to to invite dr tinoku who is a, a great researcher and and to share with you and, and professor tinoku that there are many many uh, clinical investigators connected to our network Right now, Professor Dalton Precoma from uh, Parana is connected to us. There is a, 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 a clinical research network, more than 50 cardiovascular investigators connected to your lecture. Then uh, with this in mind, I'd like to invite Dr. Tinoku to, to bring his comments. And then I will start to send you the questions from the audience. And I have my, my personal private case and I, i want to share with you one case i just saw today dr tinoko thank you for for joining us uh, this is a fantastic lecture dr naruna congratulations thank uh, you. it's very important uh, in during this pandemic time uh, to return the past the autopsy uh, autopsy uh, in clinic Uh, and not uh, uh, not on pathological correlation uh, this is a very important uh, uh, for cardiologists the old cardiologists uh, Italian uh, 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 in Germany uh, create a, a robust uh, clinical pathological correlation in our uh, history cardiology and uh, now the connection the physiopathology uh, use in, and connection uh, uh, the uh, cardiac resonance uh, create a new environment to uh, detect uh, and, and create a new vision about the this uh, physiopathologic and etiopathologic aspect in COVID uh, myocardial disease. 
uh, Dr. Narula uh, is very interesting because uh, uh, the group, uh, the uh, university, São Paulo University, uh, published in the British Medical Journal in, in Lancet the first case uh, a, a, a young boy uh, with a necropsy uh, using electronic uh, uh, microsco microscopy uh, identify the the coronavirus inside the, the cardiomyocity. Uh, this is uh, one one case, but uh, this is very important uh, because uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, during uh, many months, uh, I studied day by day, and no case about the cardiomyocity uh, with the presence of the, the coronavirus. Uh, but the, this physiopathology, the macrophage, uh, and uh, the connection cytokines, uh, and create a new kind of the uh, uh, definition the, the myo myocarditis because in the uh, previous uh, definition cardiomyos uh, myocard uh, myocarditis uh, don't use the macrophage with a criteria uh, it's very important to do to, to uh, demonstrate the necrosis and lymphoma, uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, cardiomyopathy necros, uh, uh, necrosis, and presents the uh, lymphocytic uh, infiltrates. This is, uh, uh, in, in my opinion, is a, a, a new vision about this uh, kind of the cardio, cardiotoxicity, uh, 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 and now uh, incorporate this new vision in my uh, uh, my observation, the the, the cases uh, the the, the myocarditis, uh, Doctor Narula, in your opinion, the use of the uh, uh, methylprednisolone uh, in this case with a, a huge damage uh, and uh, uh, heart failure. Uh, uh, with a, a, a high level of the uh, cytokines, is a a, a a good strategy to in, in this case. Uh, so, uh, uh, Professor Tinoco, uh, uh, very well summarized, and I think you summarized it even better than I spoke um, uh, when you when you said that uh, it is a novel kind of a mechanism because earlier. I uh, I fully agree with you that the way the myocarditis used to be defined was the presence of lymphomononuclear cells with a myocyte damage uh, sitting next to it, and now it is more the macrophage um, uh, uh, macrophages causing it, as well as uh, the cytokines causing it, and uh, the actual myocyte uh, presence of virus, which is necessary for the definition of the viral myocarditis when we talk of the uh, Coxsackie and uh, other kind of uh, viruses that these viruses sit in the myocyte that is not seen and it is only a case report quite like one I fully uh, remember the one which came in Lancet from um, uh, Sao Paulo and uh, there was uh, another case which was the uh, uh, of the uh, the uh, the uh, 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 Kawasaki type uh, of a picture in the child where also they uh, it has been demonstrated. So there are about two or three reports and the exceptions actually prove the rule here that uh, it is kind of uh, uh, what we should say as a cardiac cytokinopathy or something okay. like that uh, which we are seeing. And uh, since uh, it is a cytokine access, uh, there are three cases which we uh, just submitted uh, to uh, to uh, for the publication uh, to uh, Jack uh, case reports, and uh, so one which came on first day, uh, uh, we were not able to uh, recognize it, and this is in collaboration with uh, my friend from uh, Las Vegas, who's chief of cardiology there, and so this first case comes in, and within about sixteen hours the patient died 
because we were not able to identify the right kind of a thing by the time the covid diagnosis was made and all those things and we recognized the situation the patient was gone uh, learned from that case and the next two cases were uh, where we were able to use the tocilizumab and we were able to use the uh, uh, the steroids and we were able to uh, protect them and within 3 days these patients uh, resolved and recovered uh, they all were swab negative they all had a previous positive swab so basically it resolves and uh, the similar things we have seen in the uh, ici inhibitor uh, cardio oncology cases where you give the checkpoint uh, immune inhibitors and um, and uh, they have the macrophage damage you give them the uh, and you see similar picture in the uh, in the uh, cmr and you give them the steroids and it melts it it it, it recovers immediately so basically something very similar that uh, we are seeing in these cases and you were very right uh, that uh, this is a newer entity and as uh, dr botelo said just said that uh, this is a new condition where we need to learn on a day to day basis and uh, this was when uh, the patients were coming in in march and april that on a daily basis we were learning today and applying tomorrow okay we learned all about the echocardiograms today and applied it tomorrow so you both have presented it very well and i'm grateful for uh, adding to what i presented uh, please uh, more two question what are your opinion about the cautious in uh, in this presence of the very myocarditis uh, 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 this is your prat use cautious in uh, for patient with uh, myopericarditis in the covid setting so a uh, great question uh, dr tinoco and uh, as uh, uh, dr botello is uh, saying that uh, you are one of the best uh, philosophers and thinkers of um, uh, of the uh, of uh, the country um, the uh, uh, important thing is that uh, colchicin uh, uh, you do uh, agree that uh, not only colchicin even the canecolumab uh, something similar which is working on the il1 it helps in the uh, myopericarditis uh, cases as was the uh, recent uh, paper that you saw in uh, jack but more importantly yesterday uh, uh, which you are obviously aware yesterday the paper came again from montreal uh, uh, and uh, quebec uh, that uh, you have seen the study which is called call corona uh, or the colchicin in corona and uh, has been showing um, the impact uh so uh, the study came yesterday only and i have not been able to fully review it uh, but yes they they are showing a significant uh, in a randomized uh, uh, properly done study they are showing the effect of uh, colchicin and uh, when i looked at it i started admiring some of the old drugs that uh, this is the time we really need to start repurposing uh, some of the very well proven drugs in past uh the the last question about the new vision about the takotsubo disease uh, uh during the, the december 20 uh, 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 19 the uh, a very interesting paper the english uh, uh cardiologist that analyzed the macrophage uh, in the peripheral uh, and used a marker uh, a new marker for Uh, 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 a material to uh, use uh, in resonance uh, with a metal uh, 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 material and de demonstrate the 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 macrophage present uh, inside the the heart create a, a, a inflammation uh, uh, in the, the the typical cases of the 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 tacotsubo create a, a new vision about the pathophysiology what your opinion about this uh, new kind of vision the uh, tacotsubo uh, mental stress macrophage activation and uh, myocardial inflammation uh, again uh, dr tuko a superb question again and uh, i fully agree with you again that uh, it was a novel uh, Uh, methodology uh, novel pathophysiology which was uh, presented and it could uh, function something like a uh, again a very high macrophage activation and a hyperimmune state 
which uh, may be occurring in uh, such a case. However, uh, uh, what uh, it uh, uh, did was that it reminded me of one of the cases which uh, I had seen when I was doing my fellowship back in uh, uh, early 1990s in uh, Mass General Hospital. And uh, I distinctly remember one of the patients. And uh, uh, I remember her name also, obviously, for confidentiality. I uh, obviously um, uh, cannot uh, speak much. But uh, there was a patient whose uh, son had committed suicide. And uh, she was uh, 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 a person who was suffering from pheochromocytoma. And uh, uh, son committed uh, suicide. And uh, 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 actually, pheochromocytoma was not known. And when the she came with the pulmonary edema and found to have the normal coronary arteries and uh, the endomyocardial biopsy was done, which demonstrated uh, significant um, uh, uh, damage uh, to the subendocardium and um, uh, 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 global subendocardium. And why? Uh, because uh, normally when you have the damage to the subendocardium in the ischemic uh, condition, three, four layers of the myocytes are uh, are spared because you get the oxygen from the blood. But whenever you have pheochromocytoma or things like that, the damage occurs more in the first three, four layers. And uh, then there were lots of macrophages sitting in there. And that now, at that time, we did not even understand that it was a Takotsubo. Now, I, in retrospect, I think it was a Takotsubo syndrome. And I've seen significantly large number of uh, macrophages in that particular case. Now, is that macrophage present because of the myocyte damage that is occurring and they have come there as these scavengers or uh, they are the ones who are actually a part of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the syndrome? Uh, is it a macrophage activation syndrome, MAS, or is it uh, the uh, macrophages or it is both, a combination of both? So I do not know. And uh, I, uh, uh, although I fully agree uh, with uh, uh, your uh, 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 suggestion that this is a very novel thing, um, uh, uh, I think we really need to know uh, a bit more before we will be able to see the cause and consequence uh, 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 distinction between the two things. But uh, in the uh, uh, Takasubos, there is always a significant increase in the, uh, the circulating uh, 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 the stress markers, are they responsible for myocyte damage? Are they causing or are they inviting the macrophages for repair and uh, removal? Um, uh, I do not know. Uh, but yes, if macrophage is the leading cause and it is the cause of the whole thing, so he, uh, we probably are looking at something very novel uh, uh, and uh, macrophage activation syndrome probably has uh, different, uh, then would have a different manifestation, Takosubo being one out of them. Thank you, Dr. Narola Botelho, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tinoku. Dr. Narola, we have some questions uh, and we still have time. We want to, to take all possible information from you. Uh, one of them, we started a national program with the Brazilian Society of Cardiology to offer telemedicine, to help government, to help uh, Secretary of Health some, from very, uh, some many states, we wanted to help them to support cardiovascular disease because of the late events you mentioned and also the comorbidities because patients are not visiting their doctors and so they are coming, coming with complicated diseases. We observed an increase of uh, acute myocardial infarction mortality. And our uh, emergency department started to rescue cardiac arrest at home. Then we offered, the question is, together with the Brazilian Society of uh, Cardiology, we offer Conexa Telemedicine Network to, in order to physicians helping patients and GPs to support cardiovascular disease. What is the impact of this delayed presentation? I think it's the, the third wave of uh, cardiovascular complications. 
Have you used such tools, telemedicine, to help a, a patient without bringing them to the hospital? This is one question. Then I want to share with you one real case. But let's first comment on telemedicine. How is Mount Sinai dealing with telemedicine to support these uh, late events? Uh, excellent, excellent question again, um, uh, Dr. Botelo. Uh, uh, first important thing that uh, you folks are uh, the telemedicine kings. Uh, I don't think that we can match with your uh, uh, outreach and uh, uh, the way you have disseminated. Uh, and uh, I admire the way you did Latin study and uh, uh, and uh, brought the STEMI. Uh, I think uh, that is a model for the entire world. And uh, when we published it in the uh, circulation last year together, uh, I, uh, I I admire your uh, uh, conceptual um, uh, uh, advances in there. So again, when it comes to the uh, the telemedicine network, uh, yes, we are doing the telemedicine network, but uh, at least uh, I can tell you that we have not become as established as you people are. So I I have to learn from you rather than. Um, uh, uh, rather than you asking me, that is number one. Number two, that uh, from the myocardial infarction that you are saying, yes, there is a likelihood that uh, there may be a delayed uh, thing which may be uh, uh, happening in, uh, uh, in 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 this. And the possibility is that inflammation in the plaque is causing the atherosclerosis to progress at an accelerated rate. And as a matter of fact, with Dr. Leslie Shaw and with Ron Blankstein, Leslie from Cornell and Dr. Blankstein from uh, 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 from uh, Brigham and Women, we just put a grant together to the NIH where we are looking at the CT, uh, 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 in, uh, those people who have had CT in past and then they developed the COVID. Seeing six months to one year after that, whether they accelerated their disease as compared to those people who have not had the COVID infection and they have their second CT scan as a control. And I would uh, uh, be very um, uh, 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 privileged if we can invite you to participate in something like that. And it is an NIH study. And uh, so we basically, it would be a great... Uh, great uh, service to the people if we are able to demonstrate to them that it is indeed uh, uh, causing um, uh, uh, an acceleration. And if it is so, bringing to Dr. Tinoco's point again, that would colchicin be a way to go in such cases? Should we really start the patients who have the coronary artery disease in past and those who have developed COVID, they must be put on colchicin or something like that. Colchicin in any ways recently has been shown to be important in the patients with chronic stable coronary artery disease. Uh, earlier, it was shown, shown in the acute coronary syndromes. But if we start doing it, it might be one important way to go in such cases and being treated with the colchicin in these cases. So I would invite you to be there because, again, on one hand, um, uh, you people from DASA are the kings of CT imaging. On the other hand, from Conexa, you are the kings of telemedicine. And uh, be putting it together, and then you have got the great outreach in terms of the CROs. So uh, I think I think you are probably the best suited for resolving a problem like that. And uh, it will be it will be truly a privilege to work together on that uh, 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 proposal. This is just incredible. This is a, an absolute proof of synchronicity, because before. Uh, sharing the question, I told you that I, I'd like to share one real case that I just saw. I saw the patient today. The patient is a 34 years old boy, an athlete who happened to have COVID like uh, 20 years ago. We don't precisely know. It was like 20, uh, 20 days ago, sorry. We, we, don't, uh, we don't exactly know, but it's around uh, 20 days. He's already uh, IgM positive, but PCR negative. And he came 
for a regular uh, lung CT, asymptomatic. The guy from the coronary CT who was trained with Ricardo Curi, that you know very well, the guy uh, uh, recognized a calcium in the LED. So he recommended to, to see the coronary arteries. It was not scheduled to do to see the coronary arteries of a 34-year-old asymptomatic guy. And then it came the question, a vulnerable plaque in the proximal LED. Uh, uh, lipid rich, ulcerated, with a very, very small remodeling. What is this animal? He, he's a, an athlete. He's not a hypertension, no uh, high cholesterol, no risk factor, zero. And now it comes with a, with a vulnerable plaque in the proximal LED. What, to, what is this animal? May it be the endothelium lesion that you, you mentioned in the beginning of your lecture? Number one. What to do with this guy? Should we give him depth, clopidogrel and aspirin, uh, statin, or PCSK9? What to do with this guy? Uh, there is no data on, on a population study to decide there is a asymptomatic patient with a vulnerable plaque after COVID. This is a case that I'd like to share with you the image. I will ask the guys to send you the image so that we can learn. And uh, the patient is absolutely asymptomatic. I mean, I, I fully agree with you here. And that is what our hunch was. And that is what I wanted to look at. And uh, that is why we wrote the grant. And I will share the grant with you. And uh, as soon as it is funded, because NIH is very much interested in it. So it is being reviewed at this point in time. And we should be hearing about it. I think we will come to you and uh, start working with you on that. Great, great. Any comment, Tinoco? Uh, have you seen something like that? Uh, nowadays, Roberto, Professor Narula, uh, the Brazilian, uh, uh, Brazilian Cardiology Society created a task force uh, to uh, help uh, Manaus uh, because the uh, health system collapsed uh, and using uh, the telecardiology. Dr. Marcelo uh, Queiroga, our president, coordinated this task force uh, to introduce uh, a, a, a line, heart line, to help uh, cases the, the uh, acute coronary disease uh, and put cardiology uh, with the, the primary care physician uh, and population to uh, to permit uh, allow uh, 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 create a health literacy about the heart disease because the, uh, uh, a huge number the patient in Brazil uh, develop sudden death uh, during this pandemic time. So I think it's time to to thank everybody, thank Professor Narula for your time and Professor Tinoco, uh, I believe the people from organization will send some questions to the audience. Is that correct? If you are listening to us, if uh, am I allowed it to, to close this meeting? And thank very much, Dr. Narua. You, you reached a fantastic audience, a uh, high, high quality uh, group of cardiologists. We're connected listening to your brilliant, uh, brilliant lecture. It will be available in our website and uh, connects uh, the Brazilian Society of Cardiology and also the Anima and Inspirali Educational Group would like to thank you very much. One last uh, comment is that uh, I will comment in Portuguese because some people in the chat question. Nós optamos por não fazer a tradução simultânea porque ela dificultaria a sincronização da fala, do slide e a experiência mostra que o aprendizado é pior. Então, fazer a tradução 
poderia piorar o entendimento de uma fala tão precisa. I, I comment with them, Jagaji, what we have discussed about uh, simultaneous translation. We decided not to translate because it would compromise the synchronicity of your brilliant and precise talk. So uh, people are just question when will be the next uh, meeting. We'll soon uh, let you know, everybody, when we have our next meeting. And uh, again, Jagaji, thank you so, mu so much for your time. And we look forward to keep uh, collaborating with you and the NIH. Please send us the protocols. We are looking forward to work together. The Brazilian Society of Cardiology, Conexa, and uh, Inspirali and Anima Group. Thank you so much. See you next meeting.